<sighs> well, 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 well. Well. Here we are, day 30 of Wholesome Halloween. The last day, in fact, because tomorrow's gonna be something a little bit different, but we'll get to that in a bit. You'll notice that I broke out the good skeleton jacket for the occasion. This fancy little number has roses on it. Because today is a day worth celebrating. We have made 30 whole videos for this marathon thus far, and I do say we because I want to spotlight the fact that I have a terrible habit of trying to do everything myself, but it is one I am trying to break. And my friend Jamie here has been immeasurably helpful in that regard, in that he has taken a metric fuck ton of these edits. I don't know the exact number, but it has been a lot. And he is literally the difference right now between this marathon happening and me crying to myself and being very, very angry at myself for not getting it done on time and taking another hiatus off of YouTube because fuck me, I have mental problems. Don't know where that went. <laughs> Fuck. Okay. Um, I'll edit something out of that. I literally could not have done this thing without him. Like I say, we have made 30 videos thus far in as many days. 31 if you count the teaser, and 32 if you count what's coming tomorrow. Over 40 if you count the extras that are going to be in the description of tomorrow's video. But again, we'll get to that in a bit. I mean, Jesus, Lord Almighty, I have wrote and spoke to you over 70,000 words this month. If you don't believe me, fucking go count them. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Like, if you've listened to all of them, I am sorry. This is just what I decided to do for some reason. It only takes 50,000 words to legally classify a piece of writing as a novel. I could have wrote a novel this month, and instead, I wrote about Scooby-Doo. Because... I am very tired. So, what are we planning to do for our big, epic, final hurrah? Well, I thought long and hard about it. I thought, did I want to do a personal favourite, like It, perhaps? Or did I want to go out on a stone-cold classic, like Poltergeist? But I thought it would be cool in the end to strip everything back. I actually had this really cool idea that I was gonna do all of this without the makeup and uh, you know, without all the, the fancy light and I had this plan that I was gonna play like the suit up intro from the first episode and it was gonna go through and it was gonna be all like boop -ba -doop -ba -doop, I'm getting ready and then it was gonna be like pause and it was gonna go and rewind and then I was gonna be in my office and I was just gonna be like out of makeup, just, just a normal ginger guy, just on his PC, just talking to you casually. But that's not happening because I don't have hot water right now, so this is just who I am as of this moment. I, I, am, I am not getting in that shower again. I have nicknamed the bastard Steve Austin because it is stone cold. It's freezing. So this is just not getting washed off. This is just, this is just who I am now. Big old skeleton. Big old smelly ass skeleton. <laughs> What the fuck am I saying? I hope you're all enjoying my on-camera mental breakdown. So anyway, this is all to say that we're going to be talking about this. This little mini DV tape right here labelled Bitchin' First Go. Jesus Christ. This is The Last Hallway. This is the first film. I ever made. I'd made stuff before, you know, like anybody playing with cameras, I did lots of little After Effects-y mess arounds and uh, things. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? But this, this marks the first time I made a film with a beginning, a middle and an end. And it is a horror film, which puts it in the category of being valid to go into our little wholesome Halloween marathon. If you're wondering why I would subject myself and all of you to this travesty of entertainment right here, there's actually a very good reason for it. Throughout this marathon, I've been repeating this kind of mantra that one of the whole major points of this thing was to show people that horror doesn't have to be cold, senselessly violent, pessimistic, cynical, and just full of pointless jump scares, all that kind of stuff, etc. And that this is a misconception. And I know it is a misconception because it is clearly one that a 16 year old me had that compelled him to make this movie. 
Its runtime is just over five minutes. And in that five minutes, it manages to be literally everything I do not want horror to be. It is wholesome only in the sense that I personally have fond memories of making it. Otherwise, it is exactly the kind of cynical horror garbage that I would personally write off. Having said that, I do think this is worth covering. Because in spite of all of its flaws, namely the whole film, this comes from a genuinely interesting perspective that I do think is worth dissecting. And that's the perspective of a 16 year old kid who doesn't really understand horror and has never had any experience in the genre, making a horror film because they felt like they needed to make something cool and adult and dark and edgy in order to be taken seriously. And I think that's an unusual position to examine, so this is what we're doing. I hope it doesn't come across as too self-absorbed, I genuinely do think this could be an interesting and educational discussion to have, and if it does come across as egotistical, fucking cut me a break. There's, there's 29 other videos this month that aren't about me. I've, I've fucking earned this, alright? So now you're probably thinking, well what is the last hallway? Well why don't we ask the YouTube upload description from 9 years ago. Made on a budget of pretty much nothing, Pfft, <laughs> yeah. The Last Hallway is an award-winning short film and the debut work of Metal Monkey Productions. What? What? Award-winning? What fucking award? That, listen to this little liar. What the hell is 16 year old me going on about? That is, that is just bullshit. I'm just, I'm just straight, it, it's not award-winning. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, I, I am, I am stretching the definition of award winning here. So uh, this film was made for a college project. For anybody who's confused as to why I could be 16 in college, uh, college is different in the UK to America. Like I think what we call college, you call high school. I'm not sure the exact semantics of it, but uh, uh, anyway. Uh, and so it was uh, presented in class and we had our little in-house like class awards and I got best sound which, quite frankly, don't know that like little college award uh, counts as award winning in this regard, but also probably shouldn't have won best sound. The sound on this film's fucking dreadful. That was, that was Green Book at the Oscars that I pulled there. Anyway, let's look at what else this says. When Jack, a teacher on the verge of breakdown, enters what he thinks to be the same ordinary corridor he always walks through in his everyday job, he is shocked to find that for unexplained reasons, he simply cannot leave. No matter what exit he takes, he always ends up in the same corridor. With no help in sight, will Jack escape this claustrophobic hell? And more importantly, is he alone as he thinks he is? You know what? I'll, 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 I'll give it a little baby me on that one. That's not a bad pitch. That almost, that almost sounds compelling. I mean, it's not. The, the, the film is not compelling, but, but just on paper there, that kind of sounds cool. I'm, I'm kind of on board with this. I, I, I kind of want to see what happens. Except I don't because it's garbage. <laughs> oh my God. I, oh, oh, bless us. Oh, oh, that's so sweet. Um, I've just noticed that at the end, I have a geek copyright thing. All footage of the last hallway, as well as all respective characters, including Toppy <laughs> including Top Hat Jack, a copyright of Metal Monkey Productions, as if anybody was gonna steal this. Also, that copyright is not valid. Anyway, to go back to the actual pitch that's in the description, that's actually pretty accurate to what happens in the film. This is Jack, played by a friend of mine I won't name and shame. He's portraying a teacher who seemingly has something on his mind. A student, who's just my other friend, asks him to grab something, and he goes up the lift as the titles come up. Beautiful choice of font there, just stunning. And then comes into this hallway and when he enters one door, this happens. Whoa, can't get out. He tries a few other exit strategies, but no luck. And just as he kind of resigns to his fate with no idea what to do, bam, jump scare. I've not played the audio here because it's just a big, loud, cheap, tacky audio sting since I didn't know how to actually frighten people. But wait a minute. Who's that? Who's that skinny little ginger rat boy with tape on his face? That's me! Well straight away we've got our first major problem here. I mean, besides everything being badly lit and looking like it was filmed on a potato, some of that is YouTube compressing the hell out of all our videos, but I'm not gonna lie and say it's all down to that. 
But here we go, look at this guy. How is anyone supposed to believe that this loser is in any way intimidating or a threat? I've seen more fearsome chihuahuas. I don't even care that I've got a bat. Look at the size of me. My swing with that thing wouldn't register on a game of whack-a-mole. If Dracula's weakness is a steak, this monster's weakness is getting pushed over and having his lunch money stolen. Mildly kick him in the shin and you're golden, but whatever. This is Top Hat Jack. He's never named in the film, but me and my friend made that name canon. You know, it's part of the deeper universe's law, God. So Top Hat Jack continues to torment this poor teacher lurking around in the background, just making him feel generally unsafe until a confrontation occurs and the teacher runs off. There's some weird shit with a baby doll and light switch. I made it and I still don't wholly get what that's all about. Another confrontation occurs. I tackle him and have him pinned down in the corridor and it's revealed that... <sighs> The teacher carried out a hit and run incident but fled the scene and I'm here as some kind of vengeful spirit? God? Abstract metaphor of guilt? To kill him. And that's it. Besides another shitty after credits jump scare where my hair's grown like three times the length because I shot it later and continuity be damned, my hair grows and shrinks all over this movie. And that's... That's it. Nothing really happens. No one learns anything because they die. Nothing has any meaning. Just a bad man does a bad thing, so another bad thing comes along and murders him. And that's the whole story. Wow. Call the Academy, because we've got, we got a hot one here, lads. So what the hell was going through my head when I made this? Well, in order to try and get you into that mindset, I want to refer to two quotes that I think best express where I was at at that time. The first quote is by Ira Glass. He's a radio personality and he has this quote about what he calls the gap, right? And so I'll just abridge for you what he kind of covers in that quote right now. Nobody tells this to people who are beginners. I wish someone told me, all of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have good taste. But there is this gap. For the first couple of years, you make stuff. It's just not that good. It's trying to be good. It has potential, but it's not. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, is still killer. It is only by going through a volume of work that you will close that gap, and your work will be as good as your ambitions. And I'll explain that in a bit, but before I do that, I want to give you the second quote, which is by esteemed film critic Roger Ebert from his review of Battlefield Earth, in which he savagely said, The director, Roger Christian, has learned from better films that directors sometimes tilt their camera, but he had not learned why. The last hallway as a thing, as a creation, sits somewhere between these two quotes. With regards to the taste thing, I know exactly where this film comes from. I was not a big horror film buff at the time. I'd actually seen probably very little horror, in fact. I was still very much learning. But I knew so little as to not know that I knew so little. And I had this image, an idea, of what smart horror was because I was obsessed with Silent Hill 2 at the time, and that was informing all of my creative endeavours. Very quickly, for those of you who aren't aware, Silent Hill 2 is a survival horror game made originally for the PlayStation 2 console. It follows James Sunderland, a widower who receives a letter from his dead wife asking him to come meet her in Silent Hill. Upon arriving, James finds the town swarmed with monsters. This is underselling some of the greater complexity at play, but the game relies heavily on visual metaphor. Spoilers for a 19 year old game, but it turns out that James is being punished for some of his transgressions. The town being a physical manifestation, alluding to something awful he has done, and this is reflected in the imagery he sees. This is made more clear when he encounters others in the town that see completely different things to him, reflective more of moments in their lives, like a woman who burned down her family home, for reasons I'll not get into because it's icky, seeing a town on fire that James doesn't see. Without saying exactly what he did, there are things in this world that reflect his actions. Sexualized nurse zombies reflect the physical attraction he felt for his wife as she was dying in hospital. There's a woman who looks just like his wife, only way more flirtatious and promiscuous, who keeps being killed repeatedly in front of him that adds to this torment. And he's followed through town by a stalking, hulking monster called Pyramid Head that represents his guilt and need to be punished. The huge sword it carries around with it, a physical representation of the weight of that feeling. 
He also represents some other things as evidenced in a scene with a nurse I won't get into because it's icky and this video is pretty light hearted so far. Point is, Top Hat Jack in this movie is my pyramid head, because my taste was Silent Hill. And I learned from Silent Hill that visual metaphor was a smart thing to do. However, much like what the Ebert quote is trying to get at, while I understood that that is a thing you can do, I did not understand why you would do that. The reason Top Hat Jack is called Top Hat Jack is because he is a twisted reflection of the protagonist Jack. This doesn't come across though because A, his name is never said in the movie, just in the credits, and B, visually the metaphor falls flat because, uh, well let's say there are some key differences in mine and my friend here's aesthetic. I am a short skinny little white boy, I am definitely not this lad's mirror image. The tape over the eyes and over the mouth was supposed to, besides making me look slightly more intimidating, symbolise Jack having turned a blind eye to his victims and he never said a word to anybody. You get it? It's visual metaphors! Like in Silent Hill! And the protagonist saying the toy cars in this weird purgatory we created for him and the baby doll were very 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 blunt on the nose nods to his crimes. The car representing the hit and run and the baby doll, his victim, a child. And I know that's tasteless as shit now, especially when handled so badly, but I was 16 and had the impression that this bleak, horrid thing was somehow adult. It's a dumb, tacky inclusion that isn't handled well. But the thing is, all these metaphors are all well and good, but what's the point in any of them? Why are they there? What am I saying? They allude to the guy's crime, sure, but so? When it's only five minutes long, the protagonist learns nothing. We're obliquely told what happened anyway in this shitty little news report style thing that, oh, what was I thinking? What does any of that achieve? Silent Hill 2 doesn't just have metaphors for the sake of it, they build on the world. We understand Silent Hill better when we realise everyone sees different things. The things each character sees tells us more about who they are. The places the plot goes and the stuff James did is a lot more complex and morally grey than killed a child and ran away too. This film is Silent Hill, made by somebody who fundamentally doesn't understand Silent Hill, but knows that it's smart, understands that it's celebrated, and thinks he knows why, but hasn't quite grasped it yet. So what we end up with is this weird mishmash horror movie, made by a kid whose main exposure to horror at this point isn't even in the same media format, creating visual metaphors because he thinks that's what he's supposed to do but is not sure why, ones that are either so abstract as to go completely unnoticed by the audience, or so on the nose as to be almost childish, and then to fill in the blanks where he can't just homage Silent Hill with this punishment purgatory thing he's ripping off, he just relies on flexing this one special effect he knows how to do, which is just a split screen because he edited this shit in fucking Sony Vegas 5 or something, he hadn't quite evolved to the point of Avid and Adobe software yet, and he milks that the entire movie while simultaneously populating the lulls with what he presumes horror is, cynicism, jump scares, violence, and dark brooding misery with unlikable horrible people as both the leads and as the antagonists. And this educated guess of what horror is comes from pff, what? 10 maybe horror films I'd seen at this point in my life, 15 at a push in only 16 years of being alive. It's a disaster. It's a terrible, terrible short film on both a technical level and a narrative level. But it's also my first film. It's learning. I hate this film. But I don't really. I love it. I mean, I do hate it in the sense that I'm looking back on it and it's it's so misguided and and so naff, but it thinks it's so clever and it's not and it's badly lit and it's badly shot and it's badly acted. I'm sorry to all my friends who are in it, but ugh. But it was also something I made and I was so excited and proud of that fact. I taught myself to edit off of YouTube videos and I felt so smart about that and I had something to show that I could do that now. And it looked just like I imagined, you know, in my head it was so professional, it was so amazing. I was showing everybody it, anybody who would watch it. And I put it on YouTube and it got 96 views. Something that would 
horrendously disappoint me now. I was overjoyed with at the time. I was thrilled because 96 people had saw my amazing little movie that I made and I miss that feeling so much. The reason I wanted to cover The Last Hallway is, truthfully speaking, to remind myself what being proud of something feels like. Because I look at this god-awful piece of shit and I am reminded of the fact that there was a Daniel long before Dan Drambles was ever a thing. There was a Daniel who was immensely proud of it. A Daniel who stayed up all night converting overpriced mini DV tapes he'd had to save up money to buy into digital files so he could put them all together on a computer with a broken mouse ball. A Daniel who grabbed a dodgy copy of a now long dead piece of editing software and then played with it for years making anime music videos set to Evanescence and Linkin Park in order to prepare him for the moment he could release this masterpiece out into the world. A Daniel who saw this film, this shitty little five minutes of rubbish that he'd made on late night lock-ins in an empty building with some of his best friends, saw it exported for the first time and thought, oh my God, I'm gonna change the world. I am capable of that. And I miss him so much. And I want him back. And this exercise, this whole marathon, it's all been a small attempt to get him back just a little. Three years ago, I launched a Kickstarter for a project called The August Club. It was like a Geordie Goonies pilot, like a working class Northeastern kids adventure thing. But it was gonna have its own standalone story, so it could be watched on its own, but with teasers for where it could go. And it was gonna be my first serious attempt at doing something with money and a cast and a crew. And I was gonna really nail it. You know, I knew this in my head and people backed it and I got like nearly five grand to make it a reality. I started filming in late 2017 and I had my first screening of the finished film at a cinema in January 2018. And during this screening, which was sold out to a combination of family, friends, cast, crew, and I had a little bit of a following at the time, so even some fans, I sat in the front row and silently cried the whole duration because it wasn't good enough. Oh my God, it, it wasn't good enough. I could not give this, this thing I was saying on the screen to people who had invested their money in me to get it made? No, God, no, 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 no. I'd be embarrassed. They deserved so much better. This film was finished in January 2018 and I didn't start getting it out to backers until two months ago. Now, admittedly, some of this is down to financial issues, like losing my job halfway through production, which was supposed to support delivery costs and such. Uh, some of it is down to personal things coming up in my life that unfortunately had to take priority. Some of it's just down to simple time management things, like the, the comic, the accompanying comic, not being as quick to make as I thought it would be. But ultimately, if I'm completely truthful, the real reason for the delay was because I was terrified. After this screening, I literally spent the next two years on and off again, editing and re-editing, grading and regrading, scoring and rescoring this thing. And it always ended up that I'd always undo the new edits, take off the new grades, take out the new music, but I just couldn't stop myself from tinkering with it. And I just kept making it worse. But I was so, so desperate to try and fix it because I was so, so scared of putting it out there for people to see 
that I did everything I could to delay it as much as possible. I sent every single thing I could before I sent the film. One month it would be the poster awards, the next the key rings, the next the postcards, the next the comics. Then it was like, uh, let's make a bunch of behind the scenes stuff. I was just dragging out the process as much as possible before sending back as the film because I had to fix it. They couldn't get it like this. I could not be proud of this. And that, honestly, was a really, really shitty thing to do. And I'm sorry. And I don't just mean this to baggers, I mean this to cast and crew. Because there were countless other people who worked extremely hard on this thing besides just me. And I sat on their work knowing that their contributions were excellent and deserved to be seen. Because all I could see was my own personal failures and I was worried about people seeing those parts of it. So I hid their work. I delayed it and I didn't release it. And I hid the work of people who had grafted alongside me, who had put in the hours, who had been there for the early mornings and the late evenings. Some of who had traveled loads of miles just to be a part of this thing. And I did that because I was scared. And that's really, really shitty. And Last Hallway Daniel wouldn't have done that. Last Hallway Daniel saw this and was proud of himself and showed people and made DVDs as presents for all his mates who worked on it with him with a little custom cover for each of them and would excitedly tell stories about what he wanted to make the next day and stay up late talking over pizza with those friends spitballing nonsense ideas of a possible sequel. Last Hallway Daniel got all that from seeing this. 2018 Daniel saw this, and this, and this, and hated himself. And you know what I managed to do in the two and a half years since it's released to spruce up the August Club for Baggers? It's got a slightly different colour grade, a slightly different score, and a little post credits animation. That's it. That is the difference between the January cinema cut from the pre-release two years ago and now. All those restarted edits, all those scouring through old files, all those reshoots I even attempted. It didn't help. I took them all back out. It was better before. And it has taken me a long time. And in that time, I have had some mental health issues, which probably didn't help things along. But I am finally at the point where I can look at the August Club and I can say, I'm proud of that. And I should always have been proud of that. If not for me, then for everybody else who made it a reality. Because we made a thing. It's not necessarily what I'd imagined. It's not necessarily what I expected it to be. And not everybody is going to like it, as already evidenced by the one star Amazon reviews. But hell, at least this guy compared me to the Monster Squad, so I'll take that as a win. But it doesn't matter anyway, because, because I'm proud of it. I am immeasurably proud of everyone who was a part of this. And I, I'm proud of me. I, I did a Kickstarter and a lot of strangers trusted me with their money and I took it and I went off and suddenly I was in charge of a lot of people and together we made a thing. And some backers have even told me they really liked it. And parents have seen their kids on a cinema screen for the first time because we made a thing. And that's incredible. And. I wish so much I had seen that sooner. Chances are the bad guys would have got their stuff a lot quicker if I had, but it took me a while to get there and I'm sorry it took so long, but I'm there now. I'm there now. And tomorrow, on Halloween, as the final entry into this wholesome Halloween marathon, 
it is not going to be a video where I talk to the camera and you. It's going to be the August Club. A wholesome little Halloween treat about two working class kids from the northeast of England where stories are never told, who have nobody, and they're going to kick a vampire's ass, and in doing so, find a friendship in each other. And I really hope you enjoy it. Happy Halloween. Hi guys, uh, thanks so much for sticking with me throughout all of this. I think I'm gonna take a little break after tomorrow because what do you know, making a video every day for a month is pretty exhausting and I need a nap and possibly a cuddle, but I can't have that right now because social distancing, so just the nap. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe and all that. And I just want to point out since Wholesome Halloween will be over now as of tomorrow that I do have a Patreon if you'd like to subscribe to that. Right now, there's just the $1 tier I created while I focused on Wholesome Halloween. But now that that's over, you can just on that tier alone get your name in the credits of future videos. You can also get access to an exclusive Discord. And no doubt I'll be updating it in the future with new shiny options, I'm sure. Please do consider the Patreon. It's the best way to support the channel and I'm hoping one day it might free me up from doing contract work a little and enable me to make more and way cooler videos. You can give as much or as little as you like, whatever works for you, and if you can't do any of that, that's totally cool, don't worry about it. You can still support the channel by liking, commenting, subscribing to my only dance at the red button, all that fun stuff. Anyway, I feel like I've talked enough now. Good night, and have a great Halloween.